There's so many ROM hacks and fan games these days, and everybody's trying to make them harder and harder. Adding in insane boss battles, gauntlets of trainers, and so much more. The reason why these games are so popular is the feeling you get after you beat a certain boss trainer. I mean, who doesn't get a feeling of euphoria and happiness when you beat your first Radical Red run? And this brings up the question, what is the actual hardest Pokemon game? And today, I have a very good contender for you all. If it's not the hardest Pokemon game ever, it's at least the hardest one in Johto, and it's called Grueling Gold. It aims to be like Pokemon Radical Red, where they update Pokemon's base stats and movesets to make Pokemon that are normally not viable actually usable. There's multiple difficulty levels, a Nuzlocke option, Pokemon up to Generation 9, new Mega Evolutions, which with the announcement of Pokemon ZA is sounding very good, and best of all, new story elements and very hard boss fights. There's a lot more that this game offers but in order to find out, we have to jump into the world of Grueling Gold. As I said earlier, there's difficulty options, minimal grinding, randomizer options, and other game modes. I decided to go with expert mode, which goes hand in hand with minimal grinding, so you don't have to EV train your Pokemon at all, and you can just level them up to the level cap immediately. On top of this, all of the trainers that you'll face will have max out IVs, while your Pokemon won't. So let's see how our first try went. We went straight to Professor Elm and see that the world is fully in Generation 3 art style. And I immediately recognized that this is not the most beautiful fan game I've ever played, but that's not what it aims to be. It just wants to make your life miserable. Considering that Typhlosion has eruption and is incredibly broken once he gets it, I of course went with a little fire mouse, Cyndaquil. And after opening up the Pokemon menu, you can see that you can just level up your Pokemon to the level cap, relearn the moves, which is an amazing quality of life experience and just gives the player a lot more freedom in the team they want to build. I then headed outside and tested out the Dexnaf in the grass patches that have been added next to Professor Elm's house. If you wanted to Nuzlocke this game, there is indeed a lot more encounters available to you. But if you want to use the Dexnaf properly, you first need to have encountered a Pokemon already, which is fair in my opinion. We don't have any balls yet, so we head over to the next route and pick up an ability patch and an ability capsule and change my Cyndaquil's ability to its new hidden one, Unshaken. And I'm always very curious to see what kind of abilities Pokemon can get in fan games and ROM hacks. Once we pick up the Mystery Egg from Mr. Pokemon and the Pokedex from Professor Oak, we head to Cherry Grove where there is also a a new grass patch where I grab a Lotad, one of my favorite Pokemon, as well as a Wingle because if you could have Drizzle on a Pelipper and pair that with Swift Swim on Ludicolo, we would already have a great core. There were a couple more Pokemon that interested me in this grass and after picking them up, I tried to leave town but my rival Silver stole his first Pokemon from the lab and says that it was way too weak and captured an Abra and a Zubat to fight me instead. We immediately noticed that his first Pokemon Zubat, however, has a new ability called Vampiric. Every time he uses a Biting move, he restores a little bit of health. Which is honestly perfect for a bat, makes me think about Dracula a lot. Abra on the other hand gets shadow sneaked and after Silver runs off, we go back to the lab. Here we tell him everything about the mystery egg and about the rival Silver that stole his Pokemon, and as a reward we get some Pokeballs and some very nice quality of life features, like a town map and a time changer which lets you encounter different Pokemon, because in the nighttime there's going to be different encounters than there is in the daytime. Once we acquire a Donut Dog, we run into our second rival, that's right, you have two in this game, Chris. She already has a very good team for this point in the game, a Pikachu with a light ball, Meryl with huge power which both went down pretty easily, but then her third Pokemon, an Aerialate Skiploom, was able to take down two of my team members before Zubat could finish it off with Poison Fang. I mean, a flying type headbutt is pretty damn strong. The last Pokemon, Kalava, however, despite having ominous winds, stood no chance to my priority moves. Inside of Violet City, we became the richest man to ever walk this earth, because there's just this fissure that's giving out 99 big nuggets and you can talk to him as many times as you want. I guess this is what winning the lottery feels like. Empty and hollow. Being able to afford everything without doing anything for it. So I developed a gambling addiction and at this point my journey just went downhill. I went to the Sprout Tower for knowledge but the only thing I got was a good beating. Which made me realize that even with all the money in the world I wasn't going to become a strong trainer. So I searched far and wide to gather more Pokemon and create the ultimate 
team to take down Elder Mashiro and his devilish Hoot Hoot. As I stepped up to the oldest man in the region, he threw out his fighting electric type Palmo, but my donut gave it diabetes as he sent out his weeping bell to try and slurp me up with its big mouth. So I swapped out into Fuego to try and burn it with an incinerate, but it was of no use as he sent out a jellyfish. I had the perfect counter though, Lombre just mega drained, and that forced out Hoot Hoot, which you can just call Flinch Machine with its air slashes. Normally Lombre and Drebble can easily handle this thing, but we got pretty unlucky so Cyndaquil had to burn the owl instead. Wiglet wiggled his way around the last two Pokemon, Litleo and Weeping Bell, and as the Elder gets defeated, we finally gain the knowledge to try and beat the next gym leader, Faulkner. And I quickly got a reality check, he has a full team of six, with insane stats, everything is covered, all of his weaknesses. His team composition is out of this world, believe me, I tried building every single team under the sun and with the stats my Pokemon have, it just isn't possible. I don't think that in all of my playthroughs of different games, I've encountered a first gym leader that's this hard. I feel like not even Emerald Kaizo can stand up to this. There were so many attempts, but every time I tried, he somehow outplayed me. I think the best I ever got was two of his Pokemon defeated, and this could absolutely be a skill issue on my part, but I'm not trying to run around in the grass for hours and hours looking for the Pokemon with the perfect stats. And if the first gym leader is already this hard, I don't even want to know what the rest of the game looks like. So in order to save my own sanity, I resetted my run and picked normal mode this time. Which makes the gym leaders a little easier and gives your Pokemon max IVs in every stat. I feel like there should be a hard mode where your Pokemon still get all the IVs, but you still have to face the teams from X Bird. So I'm hoping that'll be added in later. Once we spawn into our world, I immediately notice a ton of changes. I can now pick where my starter trio is going to come from, and I went with Kalo so that I could try out Greninja. I did the same shenanigans as last time, beat up my rival Silver, who now only has a Zubat with just a single Water Pulse, and found out that the encounters on every route are also different, which is very cool to see because I managed to grab myself a Paldean Wooper. Two more quality of life features have also been added to normal mode. One of them is you can change your Pokemon Pokemon's nature at any time as well as their ability. And this includes hidden ability, so have fun building your ultimate team this way. I then headed to Dark Cave to grab some more Pokemon. I'm not going to show you guys every single Pokemon I've captured because there's going to be so many of them and the teams are going to change almost every single gym battle, but I will point out some notable ones. Like for example the pseudo-legendary Frigibax and this beautiful shiny golden nose pass which is now an electric rock type. And if you dig around in this hole, you will eventually pull out a subscribe button that you'll have to click. Done? Okay, let's move on to the quiz battle, which has been made significantly easier. No more Kulava, no more Skiploom. So we become rich again, pick up an egg, hatch a Sneasel out of it, grab a couple of Pokemon in the Sprout Tower, then blow it up and head back to Faulkner's gym. He doesn't have six Pokemon anymore, instead his team now consists of four, but there's still some very nice synergy going on. However, his Wattrill still went down to some rock throws of my GP, and GP takes up about half of the screen, which is not intended, I'm pretty sure. But this game is very new and it definitely seems like some glitches need to be ironed out. Onto the battle again, he brings out his Gligar and normally Suki should be able to deal with this pretty quickly, but it has a new move called Dusty Dash, a 40 base power priority ground move. But just a single icy wind from Frigibax sends it to the grave. Fluffy then electrocutes the last two Pokemon with Shockwave and boom, Faulkner is defeated and we get our first gym badge. This gives us access to more surrounding routes, which means more Pokemon to capture. And so I managed to get my hands on the Kanto and Alola starters. Union Cave is now also home to Pokemon that were previously extinct, as it's scrawling with dinosaurs. So we pick a couple of them up as they might be useful for the next gym. And as we try to head out of the cave, we have our very first encounter with Team Rocket, who aren't willing to let me leave this cave until they're done with their objective. So we have to find out what they're up to. They were squaring up all over the place, and while I was beating up the grunts, I eventually ran into their leader, Petrel. By talking to him, we don't really find out what they're doing here exactly, but I'm guessing it's some kind of fossil excavation. We have to face him in a double battle, but this is nothing to write home about. He has a coughing, Sandile, Vigoroth, and Salandit. Nothing my team can't handle. I haven't touched upon this, but every time you get a new objective, once a boss battle has been completed, for example, which tells you where to go, and our next destination is Azalea Town. Only this time, there is no Kurt the Pokeball Maker, who breaks his back 
back by falling into a well, no, this time we have to take on the Slowpoke well all by ourselves. But we do get a little bit of help from this Cyndaquil we just got out of an egg. We don't waste any time and rush in before they can cut off all of the Slowpoke tails and battle their admin Proton, who starts off with a Glimmet, which gets eaten up by my Tyrant, but it was able to set up some poison spikes with its toxic debris ability. However, Frogadier then water pulses next Pokemon Donphan, nose pass, took care of Golbat, and a Lolan Grimer gets flame wheeled out of here. The Rocket is gone, and you know what that means, right? We check out the new encounters we get in Azalea Town. These consist of a Hapini, which could be very nice if we turn it into a Blissey, Elekid, because Electivire is the best electric type out there, Magby, we also get the Hoenn starters here, which means I get the cutest, best little boy, Mudkip. Oh, and I guess Trico and Torchic can be overpowered as well. And of course, we can't forget about one of the strongest bug types available, Heracross. With these new additions, we go and pursue our next opponent, the man, the myth, the legend, Bugsy. And of course, he starts off with one of the most useless bug types ever, Ariados. I bring it down to its Focus Sash with a Flamethrower, but as I'm trying to take it out with Flame Charge to get a speed boost, he brings out his Scent Scorch, which counters it out with Flash Fire. It starts spamming not very effective Flame Wheels, so my Aerial Aces are able to take down and splice up this Centipede. Masquerain extinguishes my chicken with Bubble Beam and Trumbee comes in with Fury Attack, which is now a flying type move and is always going to hit 5 times because of Skill Link. After one more bullet punch from Scizor, I'm forced out to bring out Toracat, I spam Fire Fang 3 times to take out the 2 remaining Pokemon and acquire our second Gym Badge, which leads us into the Ilex Forest, where you normally go and far-fetched hunt. But this time, you're hunting criminals with your girlfriend, more specifically, Team Rocket. As you can see, you take on Rocket Grunts in consecutive double battles with the help of Chris until you reach Petrel. And I had to do a little bit of team building for this fight because honestly, your girlfriend is kind of useless. And the team that defeated Bugsy couldn't stand up to their Salazzle, Vigoroth, Galarian Weezing, Krokorok, and eventually even a very strong Heracross. With Protect, Flame Orb, and Guts by the way, so it's going to hit like a truck even with an Intimidate. But there was one Pokemon in my box that would change this fight on its own. And that's surprisingly the ugliest Pokemon ever, Jinx. You see, it's able to take down Galarian Weezing on the first turn with Psychic, while Raichu fake outs the Krokorok to take no damage. The next turn, Vigoroth comes out, and I am able to freeze dry Krokorok while Knockoff hits Raichu. So the turn after, Azumarill and Salazzle hit the field. One Psychic and the Mommy Lizard is done for, just like the next Pokemon, Heracross, which only leaves Vigoroth, and Azumarill takes care of that with Play Rough and Aqua Jet. I hope next time Petrel does something about his very obvious Psychic weakness. We get the HM for cut, mow down some trees and get the biggest egg ever out of the daycare, which is a lot more obvious once you realize a Whalemur comes out of it. Our journey then leads us to the city with the best music, Goldenrod. We head to the department store and hit up all the shops to grab a various amount of evolutionary items. They honestly have it all here. If you need something to evolve your dog, they probably sell that here too. And the first one I got was Lombre into Ludicolo. This made me want to check out the black market underneath Goldenrod, but I got stopped by my rival Chris. In some way, shape, or form, her Raichu she just got turned back into a Pikachu, which just made it easier for Jinx to one-shot it with Psychic. Ludicolo then dealt with Kulava by hydro-pumping it. Jumpluff chuckled that it was in danger after taking an avalanche from Bergmite, but Azumarill put a huge dent into my team as I had no counter for it. Jinx was able to hit it with a freeze-dry, and so I then sent out my newly evolved two cannon to fury attack it and destroyed Chris's hopes and dreams. But we have no time to wait because there's way more dreams we have to crush as our next opponent is Crybaby Whitney. I wonder if her best Pokemon is still that Miltank, because she's going to need a lot more if she wants to beat me. She started out with a Grafaii who was able to set up two layers of toxic spikes and then get out of there with a parting shot into Mega Audino while my Pinsir just stood there like a moron doing nothing. Audino's power was too much for my Heracross, but two cannons fury attack hitting five times came in clutch. We then traded blows as Helios took out my family of mice, but Pinsir revenge killed it with Storm Throw. Her Miltech came in and immediately got a kill with Seismic Toss, but Primeape's low kicks 
were able to finish off the fat cow. Giraffric, on the other hand, was my primate's kryptonite, as it overpowered me with its psychic ability, so Jinx came in, freeze-dried the giraffe, and psychic the monkey, defeating with me once and for all, and she doesn't cry, however, she just hands me the gym badge, which is a little out of character, but I'll take it. Development. Now that the level cap is also raised to 45, we can get some real powerhouses on the team, like Como O. And of course, that gambling addiction I was talking about earlier is very real, as I spent all of my money on coins so that I could afford some illegal Pokemon like Larvista, Porygon, and Honedge. And with all of the evolutionary items, I was able to get myself an Aegislash and Porygon Z. Of course, after Goldenrod City, you get led into the park where you normally do bug catching contests, but it's been taken over by Team Rocket Grunts. But more importantly, we capture one of our most valuable team members here for later on, Gligar. Together with him, we battle through waves of the Mafia until we eventually reach the familiar face of Proton. He basically had the same team as last time, only evolved, and he added a Scizor as well for some more type coverage. But with my two new additions, Porygon Z and Aegislash, this battle became a cakewalk. And so we save all the precious bugs as well as the bug catching contests by shooing Team Rocket out of here. Our next objective is to remove the weird tree that's blocking the way, so we go and pick up the Squirt Bottle back in Goldenrod and attack the Sudowoodo, but this kind of works like a totem battle. He gets increased stats, but even with those, he's just a regular tree, so so Pangoro takes him out, and on any other normal adventure, you just head to Ecritic City and take on the Burn Tower and the gym. But this game is built different, as they make you go to the ruins of Valf to stop Team Rocket from harassing the unknowns there. Only this time, we meet up with somebody that we've never seen before. Her name is Ariana, and she says that my hero arc ends here. But our new chapter is only just beginning, so let's take her on. Because we just added Gliscor to the arsenal, 3 over 4 Pokemon go down to Acrobatics, but then her final Pokemon, Arbok, hits the field, and it mega evolves out of nowhere and turns into one of the biggest abominations I've ever seen. I really hope they make a decent sprite for Mega Arbok, because it could look so good if done right. Even though it looks derpy, it's still really strong, as both Gliscor and Heracross get defeated by Corrosive Jaws. Mask the Weavile then comes in, uses two priority moves in Fake Out and Ice Shard to defeat the Rocket Admin Ariana, here and now as they flee from the ruins of Alf with their tail between their legs. But we follow in their footsteps and end up in the Dark Cave, where we once again have to battle our way through a ton of grunts before reaching another man that we've never seen before named Archer. He's the head of this operation and the reason why Team Rocket is back on the move. So if you want to shut down this organization, we better make sure he's out of the picture. He only had a team of four Pokemon, Metagross, Annihilate, Weezing, and Mega Hound Doom. And while three of these four are very good, I have Radigate, Gliscor, Porygon Z, and Weavile to deal with all of them. And while he realizes that I'm a very skilled trainer, he's not going to stop their plans here. So they move out once again, and we head over to Ecritique City and find Mjolnir, the ultimate hammer of Thor, which boosts the power of hammer type moves. And I love it when the creator adds in new items like this, as this gives me the ability to strike my opponent with the power of thunder and electricity. But I went a little too overboard and burned a nearby tower, so I entered and saw that there were a couple of people inside, one of them being our rival Silver, who was ready for another beatdown. And this is kinda how it went, Aegislash destroyed the first half of his team, then Gliscor came in to finish off a Magneton, but got overpowered by Artibax. So Heracross put it back into the Ice Age with Brick Break, while Alakazam made my boy's head explode. Then Sir Scrafty came in as he crunched Big Spoon man and got rid of silver. The legendary doggies jump away, we grab the flamethrower TM that's down here as well and head to the next gym, which is just made to make you find a path through the darkness. And once you find the light at the end of the tunnel, you get to battle the leader Morty here. Ghost types are a specialization, which means we better bring some dark types of our own. So starting out with Radicate was a great idea, as I set up a swords dance, hit a crunch on Rune Rigus and finished it off with Sucker Punch while it was able to set up some stealth rocks. I also take a bite out of Miss Magius's hat before falling to Moonblast, and the only reason this thing survived was because of its added fairy type. 
And you're never going to guess what happened next. That's right, I took down Miss Magius with Shadow Sneak, then sent out my Gliscor and Acrobatics the rest of his team. No more Jellicent, Typhlosion, Sinistra, or Mega Gengar. That might have been a really great lineup if it wasn't for my Flying Bat. And from this point onward, it's time for the heavy routes, as I like to call them. You see, they have special weather effects like Sun, Sandstorm, or Rain, with each trainer having specialized teams to make my life absolutely horrible. I can't deny I've spent more than an hour on some of these routes, and I think with the teams I'm facing, that's more than normal, considering I don't have any documentation on me. Or at least I refuse to use it because I like my first playthrough to be authentic. Once I got to the Moo Moo farm though, I saw that an angry Tauros came rushing out as it escaped from its pen, and we have to defeat it in order to progress and save the people around. Once again, just works like a totem battle, can't capture this, so once we defeat the bull with the red carpet, we steal one of the Miltang's bells, which turns out to be a shell bell, so definitely useful. Back in Olivine, we hear something about a sick Pokemon in the lighthouse and about how the gym leader is taking care of it, so Silver is mad. Silver is just a hater, to be honest, so let's get ourselves a Backscalibur and shut him up. After seeing my Godzilla, he literally just ran away, didn't even want to fight. So instead, I go to my other rival Chris and show her the power of my Gliscor. She basically has the same team as last time, just fully evolved with a Hisuian Timeflosion, Jumpluff, and Farigaraf, which was pretty cool. No lighthouse shenanigans needed for now though, cause Chris here gives me the secret potion prescription as well as the HM for fly, which leads us to the Whirlpool Islands with no Whirlpools to speak of at all, which is a little bit sad to see. It looks very bland and I get it, it's not meant to be beautiful, it's meant to be a boss rush game, but I'm still hoping that in the future there will be some added textures to spice it up a little bit. This route is also filled with rain and trainers that utilize that, but once you get past those with like a fully electric and grass type team, you can reach Cyanwood City. Where we first pick up a Kingleride, because just like in Pokemon Radical Red, the Gigantamax forms work as Megas, which gives Pokemon like Corviknight or Sandaconda a new Mega to work with. Straight after, we have a head-to-head -head battle with Yusin as I show him my big bird. He did have a very nice looking team with a Hypno on there, which is a little bit sus, but also a Frostmoth, Mega Gengar, Electrode, and Breloom. So as you can see, very diverse, but nothing really all that strong except for Gengar. So that means we scare off Suicune and do some team building for the next gym by adding a ton of flying and psychic types. Inside of Strug's gym though, there was an even worse obstacle waiting for me. And no, it wasn't a Pokemon battle. It was this stupid strength puzzle that I couldn't figure out. I'm pretty sure I needed about 15 tries before I finally got it down. You need to put the two colors on the right tablets, then you need to push the green ones inside the hole, and boom, you get access to Chuck. That just shows that my brain is too small sometimes. Definitely in comparison with Chuck's big muscles. And I was so confident that I went in with one Pokemon fainted, and it was my best one, Gliscor. His first Pokemon Gramble is now a fairy fighting type, so a very unique typing, but obviously the dog can't stand up to a Hurricane and Electro Ball from Kilowattrill. Mega Lucario, on the other hand, gets killed by a Solar Wings from Talonflame, an 80 base power fire type move. Quaquavel would have been a one shot with Acrobatics if it didn't have a Focus Sash. He then steps on me with his big feet, which means it now gets a plus speed and attack boost from Moxie, which could get scary if Jinx didn't have Fake Out. A dead Primeape comes in, so we use Psychic one more time before Drain Punch knocks out all my teeth, and Kilowathril uses Hurricane on this boy and the incoming Sneasler. The last one is Breloom, who gains the upper hand with priority Mag Punch, but Skarmory in the back just needs one more Brave Bird to defeat Chuck. The timing here is great because we get a call from the Safari Zone that Team Rocket is trying to invade and steal all the rare Pokemon. We start off by throwing all the grunts off a cliff until we reach a grass patch and capture some very interesting Pokemon like Cleavor, Hisuian Electrode, and Galarian Mr. Mime. While following the rest of the round, we run into Proton and Petrel. And as it turns out, they didn't only steal Pokemon from the Safari Zone, they also stole the secret potion which we have to get back. They both come at me with their full strength, only this time I don't have a teammate slowing me down, which means I'm about to unleash my full potential upon these two bastards. They lead off with a Glimora and a Crocodile, crippling my attack immediately. Both of my leads basically can't do anything against these two. The only thing that really happens is me hitting the Glimora with a Steel Wing. I bring in my Gliscor and click Dusty Dash to take out Glimora and also use Brave Bird on Crocodile, and the animation for it is absolutely hilarious. 
Next turn, Mega Scissor comes in and we use Acrobatics and Brave Bird to take out Crocodile. Salazzle comes in and normally I would take this out with Dusty Dash, but I misclick and both of my Pokemon go down to Bullet Punch and Flamethrower. However, with my final two Pokemon, Talonflame and Kilowattrill, we can kill these two as well as Muck and Mega Heracross. I'm not gonna lie, flying types have been really crucial through my wins here, so if you play this game yourself, get yourself a Talonflame or a Gliscor. Team Rocket runs away and drops a secret potion on their way, so we go and bring it to the lighthouse, give it to Jasmine, and heal up Ampharos. This means she goes back to her gym so we can challenge her, so I evolve my Growlithe into Arcanine to take on her Steel types. She leads off with Ferrothorn and Aggron, so what do I do? I lead off with Crocodile and swap out my second Pokemon for Gliscor so that I can see safely go for Earthquake and take down the incoming Aegislash, or at least the next turn because we just hit another Earthquake and hit the Ferrothorn with a knockoff to bring in two more powerhouses, Scizor and Steelix. These two just keep spamming Earthquake and Dusty Dash while my Gliscor keeps healing up because the Poison Heal. Eventually Crocodile does bite the dust so I send in Excadrill and Earthquake with that thing instead. Since everything besides Scizor is weak to Earthquake, we easily come out on top and gain our 6th Gym Badge. Before we move on to Mount Mortar, we first evolve our Marshtomp into Swampert and Toracad into Incineroar, which is going to be an absolute beast. As I just said, next up on our list, Mount Mortar. Normally there is nothing of significance in here, but now we get to fight our rival Chris once again, and she finally learned by evolving our Pikachu into that Alolan Raichu. Even though Crocodile was able to bring it down to his Focus Sash with Earthquake, it's Freezy Freeze one-shot me somehow. Which means Talonflame can outspeed and kill with Acrobatics, but Mega Ampharos forces me to switch out into Excadrill who hits an Earthquake, then sets up a Swords Dance and hits another one. We're basically hitting like a truck, so we stay in on Jump Bluff, tank a Seed Bomb and kill with Rock Slide. Unfortunately, Aqua Jet from Azumarill puts me in the grave, and unfortunately, even my Swampert isn't able to take it out because of an attack lowering of Play Rough. So eventually, Talonflame has to clean it up once more, just like the next Pokemon, Hisuian Typhlosion. And the last Pokemon for Rigoriv got preyed on by my Incineroar's Darkest Lariat. We say our goodbyes to Chris and head over to Mahogany Town, where we enter a house and pick up a Pokeball with some very useful items in it. But once I did, my game totally crashed and deleted my save data, which was a big setback and made me feel bummed out for a little while. But I managed to get it back, and the only thing we really had to do was beat Chris again before we got here once more, and this time I stayed as far away from that ball as possible. And this led me to the Lake of Rage, where there are trainers in abundance, and they all use double battle teams with water type strategies. I mean, I got beat by my very own boys Ludicolo and Swampert over and over again, until I reached the Lake of Rage and took down the overpowered shiny Gyarados. This made Lance intrigued by my battling skills, and asked me to come back to Mahogany Town to take on the last remaining Team Rocket Grunts that they've stashed in here. Like always, it's going to be a little hard to get through the maze that is the Team Rocket hideout because there's so many Grunts and so many statues that stop you, but since we've now unlocked Mega Evolution, our Ampharos is helping helping us out big time. Once all the grunts are defeated, however, and we're about to shut down this factory by killing the electrodes, we get stopped by the power couple, Ariana and Archer. And this fight is definitely something, because Lance doesn't help out like half of the time, and they have two megas, Arbok and Houndoom. You also shouldn't underestimate the rest of their team, because they are going to do some big damage, and you only get three Pokemon you can bring in here, while Lance brings High Dragon, Mega Charizard X, and Dragonite. This battle took me over five attempts because Lance kept throwing, but eventually I built myself a team that I knew was going to have success. You see, first I led off with Ampharos and used Discharge to take down the opposing Gyarados, while Hydragon took out Marowak with Dark Pulse. The turn after, Mamoswine and Togekiss come in, I click Thunderclap, which is a priority move, to get some damage off on Togekiss before we get taken out by Dazzling Gleam and Icicle Crash. We then bring out both of our Fire Flying types and head out to kill the Togekiss and do some decent damage on Mamoswine. Then it's Battle of the Megas as Arbok and Charizard start clashing, unfortunately Lance goes down. Which means his last Pokemon Dragonite comes in, and with his power combined with Talonflame's acrobatics, we take down Mamoswine, Arbok, and that final pesky Houndoom. Turns out I only needed some good luck and two Pokemon to defeat this fight. But you know what was even harder than this fight? Beating the Electrodes, who were all buffed up, and the only way I could really beat them was by adding my shiny Probobass as well as Golem to the team. Then they became a cake 
o'clock and once all of them are defeated Lance thanks me and also encourages me to go and take on Price. He leads off with an Alolan Ninetales and normally this always sets up Aurora Veil. Vale. But I'm not letting that happen as Weavile fake outs and kills it with a critical hit triple axle. That's what you get when your Weavile is literally two stories of a building high. Oh and did I mention that this fight is inverted so all super effective moves are now not very effective. And the other way around. So yeah easy just bring things that are normally weak to Price like Crocodile here as he earthquakes a bomb of snow back into retirement. Isui and Avalog was really strong as he took down Crocodile and also managed to tank a fake out and triple axle from Weavile. Eventually Gliscor buried it into the ground with an acrobatics and did some major damage against the incoming Mamoswine with knockoff before also biting the dust. Drumbo the Kama Ode used the Clangorous Soul, killed Mamoswine and set up an Arctozolt to then hit it with a clanging scales but it wasn't enough. But luckily for us we have our big giant Godzilla in the back with an Ice Shard and an Icicle Crash, the last two Pokemon get finished off and we get the 7th Gym Badge and the ability to move on to Goldenrod City to wipe out Team Rocket once and for all. First we destroy Petrel for the last time, he does have some pretty cool team members with an Iron Moth thrown in there and a Goldengo, nothing Baxcalibur, Jinx and Gliscor couldn't handle and once he's defeated we get the coordinates of the Radio Tower Chief. For some reason we pick up a bike and a good rod that we'll never use and on our way to the basement of the department store we run into Silver once again. Don't know why but he always seems to be tangled up with Team Rocket. Could always be because of his father of course but that's no reason to go and interfere with my business. Luckily for me the first three Pokemon Scrafty, Baxcalibur and Miss Magus all fell to acrobatics from Gliscor and Talonflame. Both of them did get snapped into oblivion by Crobat but Frodo could deal with it by using an Ice Crash while the last two Pokemon Magnezone and Mega Alakazam fell to Crocodile's Earthquakes. Silver goes on to his last training arc and we battle through the last couple of grunts that are guarding the director. He thanks me for saving him and also hands me the radio card so that we can get into the final section of the tower. But we're not alone here as Silver wants to make up for all the times he got in our way. He's ready to fight by my side against the final two admins, Ariana and Archer and I can only pick three Pokemon just like I could with Lance. Unfortunately Silver is kind of useless in this battle and it doesn't help that my opponents now have legendaries and megas on their side. Don't ask me how they got a hold of Ho-Oh and Lugia. In my opinion this fight is the second hardest in this entire game, the hardest is still coming up later. It's mostly because I didn't have the best team composition against my opponents and once again Silver just doesn't do a lot for me. After 18 attempts however we finally managed to beat these two powerhouses of trainers. We lead back Excalibur and Luxray against their two legendaries. Even though Luxray gets burned by Sacred fire he immediately gets rid of it with Lumberry, which means that we can double up on Lugia to kill it with Icicle Crash and Crunch. We try to double up on the Ho-Oh but they swap them out for Arbok. That means that we could take it out by Rock Slides the next turn. I bring in Golem and Silver sends out Celesteela. No idea how he got this thing but together we were able to take down Iron Thorns as I miss my Stone Edge. Then two Megas show up right in front of me so I go boom with Explosion and do major damage on Houndoom while also taking down Arbok. I send out my last Pokemon Gliscor and set up a Swords Dance while Celesteela takes out Houndoom, then I finish off Ho-Oh and the last Pokemon, Brood Bonnet with Acrobatics, and so these two have been defeated. We enter the room straight behind them and see that Giovanni is standing there in front of us, mocking me for being too late. Their plans are in full swing and if we want to stop them once and for all we better go to Kanto. But unfortunately we aren't able to enter until we become Pokemon Champions. So our next objective is going to be to defeat the 8th Gym Leader Claire. We get that by doing the biggest ice puzzle you've ever seen in your entire life. Then we barge down the doors of her gym just to see that there's no lava parkour, just a straight line into her face. We waste no time as we tell her that we're here for her gym badge. She immediately sees the determination on my face and throws out her drud again, which is now also part rock type. I just used one triple axle with Weavile and that's all we need to force out gouging fire. You know, the Entei with the big hat. Try to go into Golem but I didn't know this thing had earthquake so yeah we're dead. I counter back with a Crocodile earthquake to take it down though but Hydrapple finishes me off. Acrobatic's Talonflame comes in clutch however and the oversized seahorse 
Hexcores also gets taken out by Bax Calibur this time. I swap in the Gliscor thinking that Haxorus can't two shot me, but unfortunately, I was wrong. My perfect counter Weavile takes care of it with Triple Axel, and normally it would also take down the last Pokemon Mega Altaria with it if it hadn't missed. So instead, we had to chip it down until my Bax Calibur could finish it off with a last Ice Shard. Being the sore loser that Claire is, she's not going to give me the Gym Badge. Nope, she's sending me to the Dragon's End to beat up a Totem Dragonite, which is the easiest thing you could have given me with all the ice type moves I've got. With this strength being witnessed by her, she finally gives in and hands me the badge. And if you thought it was going to be smooth sailing to the Elite Four and Champion now, you are absolutely wrong, because now we face the hardest routes out of any Pokemon game. Or should I just say one route, which is just filled with trainers and weather. One part is sunny where all the trainers are running sun teams, then there's rain teams, sandstorm teams, and finally hail teams. There's absolutely no way around these trainers, and they have better teams than most gym leaders. If the league is shaping up to be anything like this, I'm in for an absolute butt smacking. Unfortunately, once I got through all of these battles, my unluck just kept on going. As I ran into Blue at the Victory Road gate, he told me he needed my help with defeating Giovanni as he went to Cerulean Cave to capture the legendary Pokemon Mewtwo. And if he manages to get his hands on it, the world might be thrown into chaos. So he brings me over there and we traverse the cave, picking up some very nice Mega Stones that we'll never use, and eventually facing a waterfall to see Blue facing the Mafia boss. We jump in as his backup and pick three Pokemon to enter into this fight. And if you thought that Chris, Lance, or Silver were useless, Blue is the pinnacle of please stop it, fall off a cliff, I don't need you in this battle. He barely does anything for me and made me try this battle over 52 times before I finally managed to complete it. It doesn't help that Giovanni's team consists of a Gold Dango, Grimmsnarl that sets up screens, a shiny Mega Mewtwo egg that basically one-shots everything after it sets up a bulk up, but also Fezendipity, Great Tusk, and Ting Lu, which, as you may know, are pretty broken competitively. Eventually, I decided on a team that consisted of a Choice Bandit Crocodile, a Sinistra with Leftovers, and a Scizor that was a Mega. Both of our abilities immediately lowered their attack by two stages, which is definitely good for Grimmsnarl, but that doesn't mean we can leave it on the field, because otherwise it's just going to keep setting up screens. I just start off by crunching the Goldingo twice to take it out while it set up a nasty plot and Grimmsnarl gets Thunder Wave by Gyarados while using Fake Out. Once Fezendipity comes in, I bring in Scizor. I'm able to set up three Sword Dances because these two don't target me, they target Gyarados instead of my previous testing phases, allowing me to bullet punch sweep the rest of the team together with Kartana, not even Mewtwo or Great Tusk could do anything against me, and I'm honestly just really glad that I'm finished with this fight. But we're not done here, as Mewtwo starts rampaging and attacks me in a fit of rage. I tried to capture it, but unfortunately it's not possible. So we whittle it down with two crunches from Crocodile, hit an acrobatics with Talonflame, and finish it off with Scizor's bullet punch. Blue brings me back to Victory Road and wishes me luck in my champion's quest. As I stand in front of the cave, I feel a tap on my shoulder. It's my rival, Chris. She wants to face me one last time before we become the strongest trainer, because she's also got her ultimate team ready. She's definitely not playing around because her first Pokemon is immediately a mythical, Celebi. And you know what my answer for that is? Talonflame, use acrobatics. We also get one off on the next Pokemon Iron Bundle before going down. Crocodile then comes in with Choice Scarf, we can outspeed and kill it with Earthquake, just like the next Pokemon Mega Ampharos. We use a Machic Gotcha on the guy from Ice Age to force out Typhlosion, who burns up my Sinistra. One more Earthquake from Crocodile and it's down, but Azumarill has different plans in mind, as it takes an Earthquake very well with its Citrus Berry, encounters back with liquidation, so I have to bring in Mega Scissor and use Bullet Punch two times to win my final battle against Chris. Then finally at last, we entered Victory Road, and this cave is once again filled with the best of the best trainers. They might not have weather advantages, but that doesn't matter, their teams are built different. There is also a big reward waiting for you in Victory Road, a ton of Paradox Pokemon for you to capture, as well as some legendaries like Solgaleo and Lunala. 
can also get Kupfu here, but I have no idea how to evolve it, so unfortunately we won't be using any Urshifus today. But now we definitely have a lot more Pokemon to build a team with. Unfortunately, it's not time for that yet, because first we have to take on our final rival battle against Silver. He was waiting for me in Victory Road and immediately throws out the Pokemon I can't use, Urshifu. Talonflame with Acrobatics was all I needed to take it down, as well as the next Pokemon, Flutter Mane. For Baxcalibur, I bring in my Mega Evolved Scizor and take it out with a single Bullet Punch. Iron Treads then close combats me, which means we're forced to swap out into our own Elephant, and as I try to go for close combat, he brings in Crobat. So I send out Solgaleo and give it a headbutt that is so zen that Crobat just falls to the ground. As I'm choice abandoned, I'm forced to use another one on Mega Alakazam, but Talonflame can then take it out to turn after with Acrobatics once Solgaleo falls. Iron Treads hits the field again, but now we have Solar Wings to burn it up. Silver tells me that I better win this Pokemon League, otherwise he's going to come after me. So let's build our final team, which consists of Ursaluna, Mega Scizor, Solgaleo and Lunala, Iron Valiant, and Talonflame, who's eventually going to get swapped out for Swampert. The first member we're facing is Will, and this is is immediately going to be a hard double battle against the psychic type Slowbro and Slow King. But all we have to do is just hit a Moon Guys Beam and a headlong rush with both of my Lunala and Ursaluna, and this makes quick work of them as Farigariff and Calyrex come out. We double up on the legendary and do the same. Headlong rush, Moon Guys Beam, boom, Hatterene comes out. Guess what happens? Exactly, the same thing. Both Pokemon down, last one remaining is a Mega Behem, and I'm not going to lie, this thing looks absolutely garbage. And I think it might have heard that because it used expanding force and boom my Ursaluna is down so we hit a moon guys beam bring in scissor used bullet punch and bam will is defeated onto Koga and here I'm thinking I'm just going to sweep with Ursaluna and Lunala because he's only got poison types but I got a reality check pretty quickly because while we are able to take out Drapion with headlong rushes by the time iron moth comes out we fall to a single energy ball because we've already taken too much damage and our stats are lowered however with Lunala psychics and moon guys beams we are able to to take out this Iron Moth and the next Pokemon Vroom as well. However, the poison damage also takes me out, so Petrant, the new Pokemon of the DLC, comes in, so I have to send out my Sun God and Sun Steel Strike it, the Beedrill, and the final Pokemon, Nihilego, which defeats Koga and lets us move on to the third member, Bruno. Starting out with a Great Tusk, which is not great enough to survive my Solgaleo's butt of a head. Or should I say two of them? Our Marouge comes in, which is not a fighting type at all, don't know why he has this, but it takes me out because I'm Choice Bandit. So we use Stomping Tantrum with Ursaluna to force out Keldeo, who kills me with Secret Sword. Mega Scissor uses Wing Attack and then Bullet Punch to finish it off, also hits another move on Zamazenta, and then the Dox hits on him, which forces out my Great Tusk, who can Earthquake twice, and that brings out his Mega Machamp. Earthquake does decent damage, but not enough, and so we die a slow and painful death, but we still have Talonflame in the back, and Acrobatics on this, two Acrobatics on Alkidoge, and that's the cue for Bruno's muscles to totally deflate as we step into the room of the final member, Karen. Even though she loves complaining at Walmart, it's time for us to shut her down, as my Solgaleo is up against a thousand spirits. Once I hit a Sunseal Strike, they try to parting shot me, because of my ability that cancels it out, which leaves it on the field for another turn, making it an easy target for another strike as King Ambit hits the field straight after. Great Tusk can Earthquake it, then close combat the incoming Roaring Moon, and after all that effort, a flip turn from Overkill is too much. This means my Solgaleo is up against Shin Pao, we Sunsteel Strike it, Mega Absol gets taken out by a single bullet punch from my Mega, and finally Overkill finishes me off with Night Slash, so we delivered a final blow with Headlong Rush from Ursaluna. Now for this battle against Lance, I switched out my Talonflame for Swampert, because other otherwise I just couldn't defeat him. Not that it's a hard battle, Talonflame just wasn't useful at all against him. So he's surprised to see me and says, <laughs> I'm ready to spam full restores. So I throw out my Sun Dog and bash his Dragonite in the head. Our Chaludon fell into a big pit after Great Tusk earthquaked it, and his Mega Charizard X got some good head. And after that, a smash. Latios finishes me off with Luster Purge, so Lunala goes for Moon Guy's Beam. We let High Dragon take me out with a Wicked Wind and go into Iron Valiant to Luster Rend it. The final Pokemon is a Raging Bolt, and as it stares at me from its cloud, I made sure to strike strike his right toe with Iron Valiant to put an end to Lance's reign and crown myself as champion of Pokemon Grueling Gold, the hardest JoJo game 
ever created. Now I should mention that this is definitely not the best Johto hack. If you're looking for a challenge and something hard, sure, this is the best contender you can go with. But if you want the best experience, I'm still going to go with Storm Silver. However, it is a boss rush game and it does that perfectly. But in my opinion, there's still a lot of things that need to be ironed out like glitches and a difficulty option between expert and normal mode. Although I do like that there is so many Pokemon already available to you. And with all of the quality of life, it's really easy to rebuild a team if your current one isn't standing up to the next opponent anymore. So I'm going to give Grueling Gold a 6 out of 10 for my own rating. If you decide to try this game out yourself, I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments down below and whether you were stronger than me and actually managed to beat Expert Mode. With that being said, it's time to thank my beautiful membership and Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support me as well, you can click the links in the description. It's always appreciated but not needed. And while you're down there, you might as well leave a like, subscribe and share this video with your friends. I'm Zwiggo, and I'll see you all next time.